Hello, everybody. We'll get started in just one minute. Still got a fair number of people jumping on here last minute, so I'm just going to give it one more minute. Okay, my phone says 201, and I always like to be respectful of folks' time as well. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Brian Dowd. I'm the Deputy Executive Director over Policy Operations and Compliance at the Department of Community Service. And I'd like to thank you, um, welcome, and thank you for attending our third, um, ooh, I almost forgot what month it was, October Electronic Visits Verification Meeting. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, we start all of our presentations with the mission of the Georgia Department of Community Health, which is to provide Georgians with access through to affordable quality health care through effective planning, purchasing, and oversight. So what are we going to go over today? We don't anticipate a super long presentation today. It's our, it's our third one before uh, in the month of October. So we did have two earlier in the month and those are recorded and on our website. If you need to go back and review them along with all of our presentations going back a full year now, we've, fart, we've started these presentations, excuse me, back in November of last year. So we've been doing them for a full year now. Um, so you can go all the way back, all the way to November when we first started and look at the history of the town hall presentations. So probably not a, a, a super long one today, but Still, we thought it was important because there were some really important updates we needed to go through. So we're going to do a quick member update. We're going to do project updates, common issues and questions. We're going to give you that third party EDV vendor update, although there has been a lot of movement there in the last couple of days to get some more folks on board. And then as time permits, we'll do a little bit of a question and answer period. So as always, I like to start with the EDV uh, member update for self-directed or consumer-directed members. Uh, not a lot has changed here. If you are a self-directed member or a consumer-directed member, we do want to remind you that public partnership is no longer going to be a provider at the end of the month. I do believe everybody has transitioned at this point either to Acumen or Continuum, but if you have not, you will need to contact your support coordination agency as soon as possible. PPL worked exclusively within the comp and now waiver, so it would be support coordination to make sure that you could get moved over to the other fiscal intermediaries, fiscal intermediaries. Those fiscal intermediaries have different ways of providing services. Um, Continuum does it through the NetSmart TELUS, our state-sponsored system, and Acumen uses their own proprietary system called DCI. So they have their own EVV system that integrates with the state-sponsored um, presentation. There will be a couple of more slides that are referenced here for self-directed or consumer-directed members. As always, I encourage everyone to stay on through the whole presentation, but it will, the presentation, after we go through a couple more slides, is going to be targeted more towards traditional providers. So, but before we go, we did definitely want to provide you contact information with DCI TELUS and public partnership. I mean, TELUS, Acumen Continuum and public partnership. I am sorry, I was using there the uh, EVV systems there for a minute. Um, this includes email and phone numbers for both Acumen and Continuum and Public Partnership is on their way out. You can um, reach Ms. Tally via email. She is very responsive. Again, this, this presentation will be available online as well, so don't feel like you have to take a screenshot, but you, you can if you want to. So let's talk about some EVV project updates. Where are we? We have a November 1st requirement for claims to be submitted through EVV, and that is still in effect. 
So we are requiring, unless there are a few certain conditions we'll, which we'll touch in just a moment, that all claims be submitted through EVV as of next week, as of November 1st, which I believe is Monday. It's either Monday or it's Sunday. I can never, I'm not good with keeping track of the calendar anymore. So it is next week we are requiring all claims, except for the ones we're gonna talk about in just a second, to be submitted through the electronic visit verification system. So I said there were some, some exceptions to the rule. So let's talk about um, what those exceptions are. We understand, and it was pointed out to us by um, a couple of providers now, that there may be an issue for members with patient liability or cost share, that the systems are not speaking between the NetSmart system, our state-sponsored system, and GAMIS, the system that pays the bill, that there's something funky going on, funky going on with the way that they order um, the claims edits, that there's just something funky in the code that is, is messing up with the date order of um, code submission. For that reason, anybody, any member who has a patient liability or a cost share past November 1st, you may continue to submit those claims to GAMUS and not through the EVV system. Now, individuals with a patient liability or cost share, which is the, really the same thing, they um, pretty much are in our elderly and disabled waiver program. For the most part, they are in our CCSP program, if not totally in our community care services program. There may be some source members with a cost share. I'm, I'm not quite sure about that. But I know that in now in comp, there is only one member with a patient liability or cost share, and there are no members in ICWP with a patient liability or cost share. So this is specific to our elderly and disabled waiver, unless you're that one provider for the one member who has a cost share in comp. This is really specific to the elderly and disabled waiver, and pretty much the vast majority should be specific to the community care services program or CCSP. So if you do have those members, you do not have to submit that, that um, your claims through EVV. You can continue to submit them through GAMUS. And we will be working, we're researching that issue still. We have a meeting about it tomorrow and we will be providing information on our website via email and through banner message. When it is resolved, we'll be working quickly to get that issue resolved. The second exception is if you have a claim pertaining to a shared service code, I've already gotten two questions about what is a shared service code. Specific to the comp waiver program, there are a few codes that allow for one service employee, one aide to work with multiple members simultaneously. And we are working to get those claims fully adjudicated through both EVV and GAMIS. There's again, something in the, the uh, code between the two and, and documenting each of those that is still a little bit of a hiccup. Um, we, we've done a good deal of research on that. And so we, we're, we're close to getting it resolved. But past November 1st, if you have that shared service code and you would know what those codes are, if you worked in the comp program and you know, would know that your aide is working with multiple people at the same time, then you are able to go ahead and submit those through GAMAS. If you, if you have a shared service code in a different waiver, then you can do it as well. I, I'm, I'm not sure, um, we'll need to research that because there I don't know of them being specific in the other waivers. Um, I did have one person tell me that they're doing that. So we'll, we'll need to look into that a little bit as well. But any shared services code, you can continue to submit through GAMAS. We do not mean by shared services code T1019 and T1019TF. Those are two different services. That's basic and extended personal support services. And unless that person has a patient liability or unless there is an open tier two ticket, that should be submitted through EVV and not directly to GAMIS. So that gets us to our third exception, which is any claim that is has an open tier two ticket with NetSmart. And you, you may ask, well, what's a tier two ticket? Well, if you call the call center or email or chat with the call center, they open up a ticket. 
If it's something that they can resolve, that's a tier one ticket. They just provide you the training or the information or make it whatever adjustment right there while you're on the call or whether they're emailing or chatting you. If they can resolve that issue and it doesn't require it to be escalated to essentially the computer folks, the programmers, that's a tier one ticket and those tier tickets get resolved. A tier two ticket is something that has to be escalated above our call center where there, maybe it's a patient liability issue. And they say, hey, there's something wrong in the system. And we've got to get our folks who work on the computers every day to research this and, and do a resolution. If you have an open tier two ticket, you can continue to bill through GAMAS. I want you all to be assured that we um, do monitor the tier two tickets. I was looking at them just this morning from the call center and going through them as far as what is um, still open in tier twos versus what has been closed. We have assigned a specific staff member who works in my area, she's an attorney, and she is now monitoring the tier two ticketing and the call center activities as well. So we do have eyes on the tier two tickets throughout the day and we are monitoring those. Um, those are our exceptions to the November 1st uh, timeline. Any other claims that can be submitted through EVV should be submitted through EVV, whether that's your own third party that is integrated with the um, NetSmart system, the NetSmart Telesystem, or whether you are utilizing the NetSmart system. As always, if you have questions or concerns about these exceptions, you can write them to the EVV mailbox. I got a few this morning as soon as the email went out, and that is just fine. We learn a lot from your questions, concerns, and comments. Uh, once again, case management functionality, we just want to talk about this briefly because I've gotten a couple of these questions lately. We are still moving forward with integrating the EVV system to provide a window uh, for our EVV uh, case managers that do EVV-related services to get communication directly from the providers and have a window into their member services. That was originally planned for 916. It has been delayed until November 11th. So 1111 is the new case management, tentative case management release date, as long as everything passes through our rather rigorous testing. Um, if it does, we will be providing early in November um, probably right before the 11th, some training guides, checklists, um, so that you'll be able to start using this functionality before the new year. There's not claims processing that is associated with this. It really is just an enhancement that uh, increases the quality of our um, delivery system by allowing case managers to have another tool in their toolbox to looking at what our members are receiving and getting some direct communication with the field. So, we have a couple of months to get folks up in training and fully using that case management system. All right, let's go through some common questions, issues. Rounding rules, got one at the very start of this. So we did implement rounding rules into EVV and we did follow the Medicare rounding guidelines, which means that under eight minutes will round down and eight minutes or more will round up in a 15 minute unit. Um, I want to I want to stop here and encourage providers to make sure that they are checking in Gamus whether or not they have enough um, units left on their PAs. We have gotten a lot of concerns lately around um, not of, on claims being denied for PAs being PA units being exhausted, and providers have come to us very very upset that. They should continue to be able to bill, but there's a, because GAMUS is not GAMUS, EVV is showing that there's still PA units left. The system of record for claims adjudication is GAMUS, it is not EVV. EVV does not put money into your account, GAMUS puts the money into your account, and GAMUS is the system of record. On every single case, that we have been contacted about there not being enough PA units, we have gone back to gamuts and the units have been exhausted. What is, appears to be happening is folks are billing some claims for members through the EVV system and some claims for members outside of the EVV system directly to gamuts. 
and then those claims are being used up. Now there's an edit that won't allow you to bill on the same time on the same day. It won't allow you to bill multiple times, but you can bill for you know, units up to a certain point. So you need to make sure that you have PA units that are left in gamuts, not in EVV. You have to have enough gamuts PA units left. Um, we're, we're, we're seeing quite a few folks who are really not utilizing their weekly RAs and matching up their claims to what have they have already been paid for. Um, you guys know I'm pretty open and transparent with you. I've had at least 10 providers in the last two weeks who had no idea what a remittance advice was. They had never seen it. And I've had to get them in touch with Gamus Resources to do a one-on-one -on -one to show them what their remittance advice is. Your remittance advice is your way that you know you're getting paid and for whom you're getting paid. Every week, you should be matching up what you've submitted versus what Gamus is saying you're getting paid for so that you can be sure you're not getting underpaid or that you're not getting overpaid. It's your total way of accounting for the work you do. And rounding rules are one of the things that we're seeing that are not being um, accounted for, that some folks are getting rounded up and there's an extra unit that's getting used each week and then providers are not aware of that extra unit being used. If you are in the independent care waiver program and you are billing on a 60 minute unit, they don't bill on 15 minute units, then 30 minutes or more rounds up, less than 30 minutes rounds down. So user invitation statuses. If an administrator can't schedule a user, which is an employee, because the name does not appear, what we're often finding is that invitation hasn't been accepted by the employee. So administrators have to send out an invitation for their employees essentially to join their agency. And then that invitation has to be accepted. Once that is accepted, then that employee pops up on your list of people you can select. I've gone through this very process myself, so I, I can totally see how providers would forget or maybe leave somebody out. But before you call the call center or send me an email, make sure that you have sent out an invitation to that user, that employee, and that they have in turn accepted your invitation so that they will show up as an employee. There is a short training video to outline this process and it's in where all the other training videos are. Duplicate claims editing. We are seeing, we are continuing to see and we're, we're working on this, um, a lot of duplicate claims edits where um, it appears that employees are working overlapping schedules at two different times. Just and, and often the first agency doesn't know that the second agency has billed for this overlapping period. If you are getting these overlapping periods, you need to contact the call center. If the call center does not, again, if it's not something they can resolve right away, they will open a tier two ticket. We are monitoring the tier two tickets and our own staff will investigate instances of duplicate claims editing. Also beware of roster billing. Make sure before you bill for services that your aides have actually performed that service, that they've clocked in and clocked out appropriately, and you're not just going through some list and adding them into EVV to be approved. Let's give you a quick third-party EVV vendor update. These are all the vendors that we feel are or will be fully compliant as of really November 1st now, we've got October 1st here, but they are all those that we feel will be fully compliant. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. I think we're actually a little above this now. The last time I checked, because that would be 30. I think we're up to 35 options, either the TELUS, NetSmart system or third parties that can be utilized to be compliant with EVV. We have a tremendous amount of options for our providers to use. Again, always keep in mind that the NetSmart system is free. 
Um, it is the state sponsored unit, so you do not have to go out and get one of these other systems. Um, this is one that needs to be updated, but it is an idea. These are vendors who we are actively in the process of integrating. Um, and we do feel like many of these folks have made a lot of uh, progress. So they may be at the point where they are integrated now. If you do have these vendors and, and you have, you're not sure where they stand, we would encourage you to contact them and just make sure that they're all set for full integration as of November 1st. Likewise, some of these providers have contacted us and said, hey, we saw on the email that, that we are not integrating with you or we don't have any vendors, but we are interested in integrating with you. If you do have one of these providers, please contact them and make sure they are in the process of getting fully integrated by November 1st. Also know that again, you have 30 in the slide we provided, but I believe we're all the way up to 35 now. I just saw some, some listing early this morning. So these slides were done, uh, I think early last week, and we have had a good deal of movement of additional providers. So I think we're up to 35 um, third party vendors and NetSmart that are fully integrated to provide EVV services in the state. That's a lot of choices for you out there. Okay, um, I'm gonna stop here, but before I, cause we're at the end of the presentation, but before I take any questions, I'm gonna remind you that the call center phone number is 833-701-0012. And the email is GAEVV support at conduit.com. I would strongly encourage you to send your questions, concerns, comments, fixes to this number, call this number, or send the email prior to sending it to myself in my personal email box or the EVV mailbox. You're probably going to know by now that if you do send it to me personally, nine times out of 10, unless it's just a broad question about EVV, I'm just going to forward it to the EVV mailbox. And I'm going to say, hey, I need EVV to research this. They will open a tier two ticket if it's a tier two ticket. We monitor all the activity in the call center. So by contacting me directly or contacting the EVV mailbox for specific concerns, you're really just adding an extra step. And, and I don't want you to add an extra step. Um, I want you to be able to get service and for us to get your, your issue resolved as quickly as possible. And also I wanna have a tracking of those tier two tickets that we can keep track of. Okay. Let me see what I have here in the chat. Any questions? This, uh, this is one that says, and, and if you could send your, your questions into the question mailbox and not the chat mailbox, that's helpful. It's easier for us to track afterwards. It says caregivers clocked in on their phone, but on the dashboard, it shows not started or late. When we call the caregiver to clock in on their phone, their visit is started, but the dashboard still indicates vision is not started. Different caregivers have experienced the system, tag it, missed visit. What do we do? You call the call center and you call the call center with specific instances because we investigate those. We investigate those not only from the NetSmart TELUS system, but I have my own staff that are now investigating that to include conversations with members to verify when the aid showed up as well as the aid themselves. So call the call center if that happens. Okay, let's see what we have in Q&A. Where is Q&A on this one? Hey, Brian, I was about to let you know there's actually not a Q&A in this one. Um, in the Zoom function, there's only the chat. Oh, okay. So well, I, I lied. Go ahead, sorry, Brian. I told an untruth. If you have questions, feel <laughs> free to send them to the chat. Um, and I received a couple of questions directly, Ryan, if you don't mind me asking them out loud for you. Sure, that's fine. Okay, perfect. We got one that says, can they still, um, and this is from Jill, so can they still adjust and void claims in the GAMIS system after 11.1? Do they basically, do they need to do it in, in GAMIS if there's an adjustment or in the EVV solution? They can continue to do it for now in the GAMIS system until we update folks in the future. We're working on that functionality right now. It will eventually be mandated through the GAMIS system. I mean, through the EVV system. 
but they can continue to do voids and updates for now through the gamma system. Nothing will prevent them from doing that. Perfect. And the second question, I believe you answered when you were talking, um, but it is, can they get RAs still from the from the gamma system? Their RAs still come from the gamma system after 11.1, that's correct? Yes. So there is a large, um, it's just a misconception that EVV is paying you. EVV is not paying you. Nothing has changed about your payment status through GAMMAS. You continue to get paid through GAMMAS. EVV is passing your claims information through GAMMAS and GAMMAS is still checking everything it's already checked. So you will continue to have access to your RAs. You will, all that same functionality will continue to exist through the GAMMAS portal. All right, I got a couple more questions here, but in order to get to them, I've got to go back. So hold on one second for me. So right there is the answer to your question. Alora Healthcare System, somebody asked what their status was. We're working to integrate. We're confident they'll be able to integrate. You need to contact them about what their current status is. Uh, you have some clients that apply that are meet the criteria for exemptions. Do I do those that apply in GAMAS? Yes. If you have some instances, some of your members and anybody who you have a patient liability or cost share for, anybody who you have shared resources or anybody you have a tier two, tier two ticket open on, you can bill through GAMAS. The rest of your clients need to be billed through EVV. Every, this is a federal mandate that is required for continued participation in the Medicaid program. So you need to continue. So for all those people who can, where you're not having one of those open ticket issues, you need to make sure that you are billing through the EVV system. How do I update the paid amount? My monthly units for September is 352, but what the case manager put in should be 364. So um, the build amount is correct, but the paid amount is incorrect. Um, so we get what is in the EVV system directly from GAMMAS. So if there's additional units that were put on your PA that needs to go on the PA and then be sent over to GAMMAS. Um, I see that you've opened a ticket. So we will have somebody pull and research that ticket and follow up with whether or not that information has been sent over. Um, the next question is just more of a complaint. The system is not showing up updates quick enough. I have care, changed caregiver in the middle of the day to another caregiver who was going to the service. I changed on my end, but the change to, in the EVV cannot be changed until almost the end of the day. What should we do in cases like that? Um, you would need to document that on paper and go in and administratively change it later. <clears throat> we will follow up with EVV about that. Um, we'll also do some research on our end as far as why that is happening. Um, for now, anybody with patient liability or cost bear bills as they always have through GAMMAS. Again, anybody who has patient liability or cost share bills as they always have through GAMMAS. Nothing has changed at this point. Um, if you have questions about what codes are um, applicable to EVV, they are on the front page of our webpage. Right? It is PSS and PSSX for CCSP, but please do go to our webpage and look at all the codes. They are specifically outlined on the front page of the EVV website. So it's really important that you, know, you go there and see so that you can just have a confidence of what is applicable and not applicable. Thank you, that's a good question. They're all good questions and comments and concerns. 
All righty, seeing nothing else for today, I told you it would be a bit of a short one. So I am gonna go ahead and, and close us out. Again, I wanna thank everybody for their participation. We learn a ton from your participation and it is very, very important for making sure this process works correctly. I hope you have a wonderful week and a good rest of your day. Thank you.